we commence our Bible study with prayer. Our gracious, holy, heavenly Father, reigning in glory, in majesty, upon the throne in heaven, we humble ourselves before you this evening and come before you by faith, with confession of our sin, pleading the precious and all-prevailing name of your only beloved Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, the Head of the Church. We ask this evening that you will be pleased to bless your holy word to our souls, that the teaching of the prophet Haggai, even though written many hundreds of years ago, will be of teaching for us this evening, of blessing for our souls, of a means, Lord, of opening our eyes to new areas of service for the Lord and issues that are going on in our lives, which, with God's help, we can deal with. Uh, And we do pray that you would so graciously help us to come to your word this evening with open hearts, open by the Lord, uh, and to have that faith to say, Lord, here am I. Send me, use me, lead me, guide me, make me, Lord, to walk in your way, the way of your command, the way of your word, the way of your wisdom. Oh, gracious God, we pray then that uh, as we plead the precious name of the Lord Jesus, that you would cleanse us afresh, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. You would awaken our minds and our hearts to the truths of your Holy Word, And we pray that we will be moved this evening in our hearts spiritually in such a way that we'll be stirred, Lord. And we do pray that you would help us to be the people of God that you would have us to be in this day and generation. Lord, preserve us from lethargy. Preserve us, Lord, from selfishness. Preserve us, Lord, from a hardness of heart to the state of the lost, to the state of the world, to the state of the situation around us in our different communities. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would grant that we will have that desire to be channels of your love, to be channels of the gospel, to be <clears throat> those, Lord God, whose priority is right, that uh, have come with Mary of old, uh, for whom it was said, Mary hath chosen that better part. It shall not be taken away from her. That she had a priority right. Jesus was teaching. And that was the priority of the time. Lord, we often are like Martha. We get carried about with so many cares and concerns in this world practical concerns. They may be legitimate, Lord, but they overwhelm us oftentimes. And we pray that you would help us to get back to the basics, to get back to the essentials. So hear us, Father God. Bless us through your word. I do pray for the the church at Ashford, that you would so graciously remember your people there. We love them for the truth's sake, and we pray that you would lead them and guide them and be with the leadership, we pray. And may those decisions be made which are in accordance with your perfect will. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now we're going to sing number 247, this well-known hymn which fits in with our subject today. In the book of the prophet Haggai, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. 247 
please turn with me uh, to the book of the prophet Haggai. We'll read chapter 1. The book of the prophet Haggai. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses, and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little, and when you brought it home I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withheld the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I have called for a drought on the land and on the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, and whatever the ground brings forth on men and the livestock, and and on all the labour of your hands. Then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. And so the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. On the twenty-fourth day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. We will read chapter two also. In the seventh month, on the twenty-first of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to the Rubbable, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory, and how do you see it now, in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake the heaven and the earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. And they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. On the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food, will it become holy? 
Then the priest answered and said, No. And Haggai said, If one who was unclean because of a dead body touches any of those, will it be unclean? So the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. And now, carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one comes to a heap of twenty ephahs, there was but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw out fifty bars from the press, there were but twenty. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail on all the labours of your hands. Yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, from the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day I will bless you. And again the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the twenty-fourth day of the month, saying, Speak to the Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth, I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms, I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. And so reads the holy word of God for our instruction together this evening. Well, we come this evening to consider the book of the prophet Haggai in our series upon the minor prophets. And uh, the subject before us this evening is wise challenges for the people of God. Now the faithful warnings of God's prophets to the Jewish nation because of their idolatry had been fulfilled. Jerusalem had been conquered by the Babylonian army and the nation had been taken into captivity. Judgment had come because the covenant people of God, the Jews, had forsaken the true faith. They had violated their special relationship with the Lord by worshipping false gods. <clears throat> the Jewish nation and its leaders had repeatedly refused to repent of their sin and turn to God for mercy. And as a consequence, and according to the sovereign justice of God, the city of Jerusalem and its walls were broken down by the Babylonian army. The majestic temple that had been built under the direction of King Solomon was destroyed by fire. Most of the inhabitants of the city, including the wealthy, the influential and talented, were carried off into exile. Only the poorest people were left to cultivate the land. The message that the holy men of God the prophets had so faithfully predicted for many years had come to pass. However, now under the sovereign permissive will of God and according to his prophetic word, seventy years later the Cyrus, the Persian king, conquered Babylon. Then in the first year of his reign over Babylon, God moved his heart to proclaim a decree Jewish exiles should be encouraged to return to their homeland. They should be encouraged to restore the city of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Remarkably, this event had been accurately prophesied by Isaiah over a hundred years earlier. In Isaiah 45 verse 1 we read, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open for him 
the two leaved gates, and the gate shall not be shut. In Isaiah 45 verse 13, I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways, and he shall build my city, and he shall let my captives go, not for price, nor for reward, says the Lord of hosts. Then the book of Ezra records this event as it actually happened. In Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 we read now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing saying thus saith the Cyrus king of Persia the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah who is there among you of all his people his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem which is in Judah and build the house of the Lord God of Israel he is the God which is in Jerusalem and whosoever remaineth in any place where he uh, Sojourns, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So wrote Ezra under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. So we see both Isaiah and Jeremiah had prophetically seen this day. <clears throat> Under the civil leadership of Zerubbabel and the spiritual leadership of Joshua the high priest, approximately 50,000 Jews returned to Jerusalem. And when these exiles arrive, they erect an altar in the midst of the ruins, recommencing worship in Jerusalem. They then begin the work of rebuilding the temple. But as they lay the foundations of the new temple, the rejoicing is mixed with weeping. They rejoice that the new temple is being erected, but the older ones weep when they remember the glory of the former temple. It was so much bigger, so much more magnificent. And then, in addition, sadly, they soon experience severe opposition from enemies surrounding them. Those who hated to see the work of the Lord re-established in Jerusalem their aggression and opposition cause the work to be halted. And so uh, we read in Ezra chapter 4 verse 24, Then ceased the work of the house of God which is at Jerusalem, so it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius king of Persia. Now the rebuilding of the temple ceased for a period of 15 years until the second year of Darius king of Persia. However, the rebuilding work was then restarted under the ministry of Haggai and Zechariah. So we read in Ezra chapter 5 verse 1, Then the prophets Haggai, the prophet and Zechariah the son of Odo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. For only a few months Haggai preaches and prophesies inspired by the Holy Spirit of God as recorded in the book of the prophet Haggai. He brings the word of the Lord to the people at Jerusalem with remarkable effect. He preaches with the authority of an ambassador of Christ. Several times he says, Thus saith the Lord. The book of Haggai as a whole constantly addresses the challenges that face the builders of God's temple. In addition to this, Haggai gives direction to the people about the blessing of getting their priorities right. It concludes directing the people to the promise of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The book of Haggai has a message for us today. As the people were challenged regarding the building of the physical temple at Jerusalem, so God's people today need to be challenged regarding the serving of the Lord in the building of his temple, the church. 
Unbelievers also are challenged to consider their ways as to the fulfilment of material things alone in their life. So to identify with the teaching of Haggai, we will now consider some of the challenges that are given in his prophecy. Wise challenges for the people of God to consider, to consider your ways. First of all, we have the challenge of commitment, and that is found in Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Now, when Haggai came with the word of the Lord, the rebuilding of the temple had fallen to the bottom of the list of the priorities for those dwelling at Jerusalem. They were now very busy with their land. They were busy with their investments. They were busy with their home improvements. Sealed houses, in verse 4, refers to their house interiors being lined with cedar panelling, thus depicting luxury. That was the in thing of the day. They were busy with their own personal development. They were busy with just living to sustain their increasing materialistic desires in a tough economic climate. They understood they were responsible to rebuild the temple, but there was never enough time for the Lord's work. The time is not right, they say. And we can be like that. We can spiritualise uh, these things and say, well, we need to pay more emphasis upon our own spiritual life. That is true. Uh, but the service of the Lord is in harmony with our spiritual well-being. The two go together. They complement one another. Do not be like the people of Haggai. The time is not right, they say. The economic conditions are not right for us. We're too busy. The economic conditions are not right for us to give sacrificially and spend precious time building the temple. We can worship God on the open altar we have made on the old temple site. No, they said, be reasonable. The time is not right. So in this day and age, people accuse uh, churches which have a uh, desire to, as it were, be a working church, to be evangelistic and serve the Lord in this day and generation. And they say, oh, well, you're too legalistic. And Satan will furnish us with many reasons why the time is never right to serve the Lord. But every hour we live in our life is an hour lost to eternity. We cannot get it back. Is it our desire at the end of our lives that God will say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Remember, Satan is deceitful. He can even come as an angel of light and give you many reasons and excuses not to serve the Lord. Satan will furnish you with many reasons why the time is not right for you to follow the Lord. Maybe you are considering uh, giving your testimony and reasons are being put in the way. The time is not right. The time is not right to make this public profession. The time is not right to follow the Lord. Maybe this evening your conscience has been stirred and you recognise something of your sin before a holy God and Satan will furnish you with many reasons why the time is not right to repent of your sin and turn to Jesus Christ. Just hang on to these just for a little longer. Here in the account of the people at Jerusalem they had slipped into living just for the now, for the present time. They'd lost their eternal focus upon their lives. Their material had precedence over the spiritual. This successfully kept them from taking out time to serve the Lord. And as we come out of these pandemic times, my dear friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, it will be very challenging for us very challenging. It's become quite comfortable to, to do uh, 
things through the internet. But do not let Satan take those provisions that God has given for us to continue to be able to fellowship and to hear the word of God and to have our prayer meetings over the Zoom as a reason and an excuse not to further our endeavours to serve the Lord in this day and generation. Secondly, the challenge of providence. Haggai 1 verses 5 to 11. The word of the Lord through Haggai challenged them to consider their situation. God had withheld the seasonal creative blessings from them. Were they not disappointed in their harvests? Were they not living under inflationary pressures? Was it not an ever-increasing burden to keep up with their lifestyle and cost of living? Verse 6 is a perfect description of the pain of materialism in an economy with inflation and cutbacks. In these verses we have the disappointment of materialism, the emptiness of materialism. The Lord calls them to stop and consider, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason that providence fails to satisfy and provide financial insecurity? Is there not also a connection between faithfulness and blessing for your soul? At times of providential challenges in life, whether it be failures, inflation, cutbacks, uh, 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 borrowing difficulties, God calls us to consider our ways. What is going on here? Stop. Consider your ways. The Lord gives a reason for the problem here. And the reason for the problem in the context of the book of the prophet Haggai was that the people were more interested in their own house than in God's house. Therefore my hand has gone against you in providence. Now we need to be very careful here that we do not put all difficult providential circumstances into one pot. Not all times of providential hardship are a sign of God's displeasure. Indeed, the history of the church has many testimonies of those walking in the light of God's word and way, yet at the same time experiencing difficult times in providence. However, Haggai is dealing with a situation here where the people were knowingly and willfully put in their own interests before that of God's house and God's honour. And God in his wisdom brought them to see the error of their ways through preaching and providence. Maybe this is the case for you. Life is a struggle. Life is tedious like a treadmill, little satisfaction. You are struggling to find meaning out of life, focusing on providential and material things. It's a struggle. There's disappointment, dissatisfaction and deadness about it all. The problem is that God is taking second place. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things shall be added unto you. It is always time to consider our ways. I've been thinking recently of those two words in Hebrews chapter 12, 3, consider him. It's always the right time to consider him. In the context of the passage, the people had endured a failed harvest. The judgment of God had come upon them. In our day, we are blessed with abundant food, but we are experiencing a pandemic. We live under the warning judgment of God, but at the same time, we live in the mercy of God, despite the attacks against his name. We still have food to eat. But God is speaking to us through this pandemic. And it is always time to stop. Consider our ways, because God, in the voice of his providence, 
is speaking to the nation and maybe speaking to you personally. The challenge of providence. Thirdly, the challenge of obedience. And if you have your Bibles open, I hope you have in Haggai chapter 1 verses 12 to 14. If you follow these verses through and consider them, read them as I'm speaking about them, it will all fit into place. The ministry of Haggai was in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. It had a remarkable effect upon the people. Because the ministry of Haggai was God-centered and with a God-given authority. On a number of occasions in this short book, Haggai uses the expression, says the Lord. This is the basis of all true preaching. The word of the Lord, thus says the Lord. This is the need of the hour. The word of God and the spirit of God working among us. And the fear of the Lord came upon them. Gone was the don't care less attitude to God's house. Gone were the excuses. Gone was the priority to material things. And the people under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Joshua came together to work on the house of the Lord. This was revival time again in Jerusalem. The spirit of the Lord came upon them and it brought forth the fruit of obedience. It came as a result of the power of God in preaching and the voice of God's providential dealings. And this is the need of the hour for prayer. The power of God in preaching and taking heed to the voice of God in his providential dealings with us as a nation. And these people repented of their complacency. They listened to the word of God as the word of the Lord. They recognised that God was speaking to them personally. So we see a profound difference in their relationship with God between the beginning and the end of the chapter. Disobedience. Haggai 1 verse 2. This people. Then obedience. The Lord their God. Haggai 1 verse 12. Obedience for God's glory was now the key theme. And so it is for us when the word of God comes to us in power and we are convicted of our sin and our complacency. Disobedience is replaced by obedience. And you follow the command. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things shall be added unto you. Fourthly, the challenge of discouragement. Haggai 2 verses 1 to 9. Just a short while had gone by since they had started to rebuild the temple. But already the people were beginning to get discouraged and their zeal was beginning to diminish. The first work was to clear the site. No doubt much rubbish had to be cleared away. The basic spade work was hard. And the older people who remembered the previous temple building were discouraged. They considered this new building to be a poor replacement for Solomon's glorious temple. The younger people were no doubt discouraged because they were being continually reminded of this fact. The resources available to them both practically and financially were limited. How often do we become quickly discouraged in a new work? It's possible for this to happen and it's quite common for this to happen. And so God sent Haggai to encourage them under the ministry of the word of God. Do not focus on the reduced size of the temple. Do not be so discouraged by the difficulties. Have faith in God and his word. Be strong, verse 4, and work, for I am with you. God is faithful to his people. This is the key issue. God is with you. Verse 5, my spirit remains among you. Fear not. This is the vital issue for any church and any work, if it is to be of the Lord. 
The Spirit of God must remain among us. Verse 6 to 7, I will shake all nations. The desire of all nations shall come. I will fill this house with glory. God says, national dynasties will come and go. But my eternal purpose of grace in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will be permanently fulfilled. There's a purpose in all this working for the Lord. It's Christ-centred. Also, in a saving sense, a gospel sense, people from all nations will be shaken by the gospel, be called by God's grace in Christ Jesus. Therefore, remember, the greatest glory of all is not in the size and the beauty of the building, but in the person of Christ coming to that building, coming to that people, walking in his garden, Walking amongst his candlesticks, walking amongst the people of God in their very hearts. And spiritually applied, he then will be the desire of people from all nations. The silver is mine and the gold, God reminds the people. God gives a timely reminder that all material resources are from him. As the God of all creation, we are simply stewards of it. May we not be selfish stewards. And the glory of verse 9, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. For in this place I will give peace. This is a messianic prophecy reminding us that Christ is greater than Solomon. And his temple are greater than Solomon is here. And so uh, in the challenge of discouragement, God sends his encourager. It comes through the preaching of the word of God. It comes through a word from the Lord himself. <clears throat> through the prophet Haggai. And then the challenge of sincerity. The challenge of sincerity. And that's our final point this evening. And you will find that in the book of the prophet Haggai chapter 2 and verses 10 to 19. In this message, Haggai has a word from the Lord regarding sincerity. Now God reveals to them in more depth why his providential blessing has been withheld for so long. And part of the problem had to do with their worship. Their worship had lacked repentance and sincerity. And what they offered was unclean. So to provide an object lesson for the people, two questions were asked of the priests relating to the ceremonial law. The first question in verse 12 was designed to show that the ceremonial cleanness of the priest cannot be transferred to their sinful offering to make it clean. The second question in verse 14 was intended to show that their unclean life does most certainly make their offering unclean. So even through, even though over the years the people had been bringing their offerings to God, they had done so with insincerity. They had come with unclean hearts, neglecting the building of the temple, and their worship was contaminated with sin and unclean in God's sight, and as a result the providential blessing of the Lord had been withheld. And this reminds us that just coming to church does not make a person clean in God's sight. The people are exhorted to consider Evaluate the past and now the present. The only way forward is the pathway of repentance, faith and obedience, sincerity. And the people with changed hearts will now enter into God's blessing. Them that honour me, I will honour. The people that get their priorities right, but do not neglect the house of God, will experience the blessing of the Lord. Has he not proved that to us in our own lives? Well, in conclusion, please turn with me to Haggai chapter 2 
and verses 20 to 23. Haggai ends the book on a very positive note. Once again the reality of God's sovereignty over proud nations will be evidenced. This will be realised in the overthrow of the Persian and the Roman empires. And it is evidenced through history as powerful empires and nations come and go. And yet the word of the Lord remains. How encouraging that is for us today. The symbolic meaning of God's dealings with the rubber ball mentioned here foretells the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Zerubbabel, called by God and as God's signet ring, stands as the official representative of the Messianic line, which would culminate in the birth of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So he is included in the lineage of Christ recorded for us in the Gospel of Matthew. The key words for this prophetic understanding rest on the phrase, in that day, in that day, the day of the Lord. So Robert did not leave to see that day of the coming of Jesus Christ, but he was called to be a representative of that day in his life and in his leadership. So once again, we see providential lessons in this prophecy as we have in other minor prophets. But in harmony with this, we see the pointing to the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so this evening, uh, as we have been considering the book of the prophet Haggai, let us consider our ways. Let us understand that when God challenges us, it's not God coming with a big stick. God challenges us. Because he wants the best for us. God challenges us because he loves us. God challenges us because he wants us and desires us to go into deeper spiritual fulfilment in our lives. And to know spiritual fulfilment, it is spiritual growth and service in harmony together. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, do please bless this message. There are many challenges in the book of the prophet Haggai which have reference even to our own day and age. Lord, may we be those that have a desire to serve Thee all our days wherever we are located, situated, may this be our desire to serve thee all our days. O gracious God, be with us now, we pray. Help us to face the various challenges that come into our lives. Give us great wisdom as we come out of the pandemic. And we do ask our Heavenly Father that we will have the privilege both to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and to be faithful servants of the living God, and to see your church grow, that our name, that your name might be praised and glorified, and that we will praise your name in these days. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.